from the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome again to the podcast. Hello, welcome back. It is our favorite month. October. We do love October. Halloween is both of our favorite uh, By holidays. Far. By far. And uh, I feel like we always say that we're not, you know, this isn't a scary movie, horror movie podcast, but um, we do tackle that genre from time to time. Mm-hmm. And given that it's October for this entire month, we are going to do... Uh, some scary movies for our main feature. Not necessarily do that for our picks of the week, except for on Halloween. One of our favorites, we're going to do Fright Night, um, which I'm really oh, yeah. excited about. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to talk and about that one. our picks of the weeks will be uh, horror movie centric. Extra scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that movie. But we'll save that. It's another podcast. Yeah. I can't. Today's podcast is all about Pet Cemetery. So this is a 1989 film directed by Mary Lambert, who his feature film debut started out as a music video director. You've probably seen a lot of her um, videos from Madonna. Yeah, did a lot of Madonna videos, mm-hmm. a lot of big hits. I think she was hit up to do Pet Cemetery while she was doing Like a Prayer, if hmm. my if my memory serves. Oh yeah, okay. But um, definitely do, did do that video. And uh, this movie, uh, being one of the few movies that Stephen King adapted his own novel, wrote the screenplay for so of all the uh, episodes we've done I think this particular film was a good choice because you know we're doing all these older movies movies from 70s mostly 80s some 90s mm-hmm. and this one to me kind of is almost better to watch it now when this came out in 89 there had been so many Stephen King adaptations that it was I think people were just kind of burnt out and this movie wasn't necessarily like critically panned and it's not a perfect film by any means. Um, mm-hmm. but I do think when I'm watching it now in the retrospect of like this huge, just massive library that's available to you of like Stephen King yeah. film yeah. adaptations yeah. and like, I mean, and especially now there's like a new, the new it film came out. There's, um, I mean, there's even talk of redoing Pet Cemetery yeah. too. Yeah, and there was like a Netflix series. There's also like another show mm-hmm. that's coming out called, you know, the, a, the deal. I think it's called Castle Rock. Okay. Or maybe out now. Um, but it's yeah, Stephen King's like almost like bigger than ever. And so, watching this movie now, it's like with giving all these other movies that you can watch adaptations. This one kind of really holds up. So it's almost. I think it's. It's it's this one's a nice one to go back to. I hadn't really thought about that until you mentioned it and revisiting it. Even though I um, am experiencing it, you know, d- differently than I did when I initially watched it, like at a, just at a younger age, um, it really does work. Like it still works, and if anything, it um, scares me in a different way as um, as an older viewer than it did when it initially came out. Yeah, I, I have the same feeling, and I we'll we'll get into yeah. the themes of the movie. But is, is it watching this as a kid? Death was just something that seemed it was something that I had unfortunately had experienced mm-hmm. a little bit in my life at that point, but like not to the depth of what other people experience. So it just seems something that seems so far away, you know, something you don't have to think about yet. And now, yeah. as, as an adult, you watch it, and it's something that most people. At you've a certain experienced age, you've death. experienced, or you've yeah. went through it, or a friend, or a friend of a friend, or family member, or and a so pet. the movie, or exactly yeah. a pet, and the movie plays, uh, yeah, it plays differently. It plays more on the drama, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, or some other things we're we've got going on for this episode. We'll talk a little bit about um, Stephen King and the production of this film. Also, the placement of this movie amongst um other horror movies and how that kind of fits with um or doesn't fit with a, a tone the overall tone of the movie um like we already said the themes and um i think we might even get into we'll get into a little discussion about the ending and how we both yeah, feel we, ab- about the ending of the movie we have different feelings about the ending we do we can we can disagree yeah it's fine 
it's fine. To we disagree. both still like this movie. Yeah, we like it in different ways. And so then we'll have our picks of the week. Uh, this week I picked Ironweed. I can't wait to um, hear about this one. And my connection to the main feature uh, was there's a small role with Fred Gwynn, but also uh, Ironweed is a movie that kind of plays on these themes of death and uh, seeing visions, ghosts, if you will. Okay. Uh, it, it has some of, I feel like there's a lot of connections between that movie and, and Pet Cemetery. Cool. I can't wait to hear about it. And what did you pick? Um, I I went the Fred Gwynn connection route as well. Um, I opted for a movie called The Boy Who Could Fly. Wow. I, is... I don't know if I've seen that since I was a young boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. And I was a little apprehensive about revisiting it. Um, but I'm really glad that I did, actually, because it's not at all what I like the, the feelings that I feel like when I say the title of the movie um because it makes me laugh because it it is a silly title yeah um it is is not at all the movie is not at all what um uh the title makes me think of anyway yeah so ironweed and boy who could fly those are our picks of the week and then uh, as always we'll do our murray moment um before we go to a clip from pet cemetery Lindsay, um can you please tell us uh what pet cemetery is about of course i can um, so like we already said, um, this is adapted from a 1983, uh, Stephen King novel. He did the screenplay. Uh, the story focuses on the Creed family who moved to a small town in Maine. Um, and after the death of their family cat named Church, um, this begins the father's deep dive into not being able to let death have its way. Um, thus triggering a chain reaction of one horrific and bad decision after another. It, it gets, just, it's just, it's a snowball effect it in this movie. It spirals out of control. It really does. We'll go to a clip um, and then we'll start discussing Pet Cemetery. We'll be right back. That's where I buried my dog Spot when he died of old age in 1924. Ellie, do you know what a graveyard really is? Well... I guess not. It's a place where the dead speak. <gasps> no, <laughs> not right out loud. Their stones speak, or their markers. This ain't a scary place, Ellie. It's a place of rest and speaking. Can you remember that? Yes, sir. <laughs> So uh, starting it off, um, we'll talk a little bit about Stephen King. Um, how many writing credits on IMDb did you say he has? <laughs> on IMDb, it says 298 writing credits. That's insane. Good God. So that... even in the even in the the tail end of the 80s, uh, people were already, like we said, getting a little bit burnt out on Stephen King. Mm -hmm. They just produced so many movies, like every short story that he's done, in. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's been a lot of good adaptations um, that came out post Pet Cemetery and mm -hmm. pre Pet Cemetery, but yeah, this one came out at kind of a strange time. But I do think that this is one of the few movies, if I'm correct, that he was really heavily involved with the production. And this was a movie that he didn't you say his hometown was sort of and he he wanted to involve uh, i think the people of maine like around bangor like wanted they were starting to make noise like why don't you bring a little bit of money back to the state that you're from and that you're talking about and that you live in and not that he felt like a lot of pressure from that but there was kind of you know noise about that and so yeah and for did. anyone that's not familiar with stephen king he's pretty much spent his most of his time in bangor maine mm -hmm. he has like a house there and i've been there Really? Wow. Yeah, it was awesome. pretty cool. Um, There's so, a picture. So like he is like lives a normal life there. So it's like people. He's like this huge famous person, but people see him at the grocery store. Like, yeah. But yeah, you were saying at the time there had been. They're like, why? Why are you not bringing a production here? So this was his opportunity to do that. To, to do that and uh, worked it out with the studio to where they shot, uh, essentially shot this movie in his, you know, his hometown and yeah, right, right in his neighborhood. And there was the um, like Pet Cemetery 
how it's spelled, how it's misspelled on the title. Like this is, it was an actual misspelled pet cemetery um, that he that he based the story off of. And I mean, a lot of things in 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 this book are, you know, uh, of course not people coming back from the dead, but um, a lot of things in this, like a family cat dying, R.I.P. Smucky. Yeah. It was church in the movie. And the whole thing with the trucks was actually all based on reality. He lived yeah. on off of a highway that had a small highway that had trucks mm-hmm. moving back and forth and didn't his son almost yeah. he almost had the same thing happen with his son almost going out to traffic, but thankfully did not end in tragedy. Not the not the same result for Gage in, in the movie. Um it's also uh, interesting I think to note that the Pet Cemetery he, he wrote it based off of these experiences um and that when he when he was done with it he let his wife read it and he let a friend of his read it and they were both like dude this thing is bleak this thing is dark and he initially kind of like shelved it and thought it was like wow i didn't think i could write something that was like you guys would tell me to how about you just don't put this one out actually yeah and i think it was to maybe to finish out a contract or some something along that nature that whoever uh was his, his agent who whoever it was they needed another book and so he gave him pet cemetery um so it wasn't something that he was initially like trying to shop it was something that he had shelved yeah. because and, it was and the book dark. was a big hit mm-hmm. I'm correct yeah, the it book was. was a pretty big hit yeah um but it wasn't an adaptation that the studio wanted if that's uh, it was really a movie that had to get lobbied very hard for by the producers who wanted to um, bring it to the big screen. And I believe, if I'm right, it was yeah. there was a writer's strike going on. Yeah. And it was one that was it was a script that was finished. And they, so they were like, "All right, fine. You know, we it, have to do it. We don't have a choice." They were like, "We need we need it's something that's go. that's finished, that's like ready to go." And like, I think that this the Pet Cemetery had been been being lobbied to do, but it kept being pushed aside. Yeah. Like, no, it's too dark. It's like we don't want to do that. And then here's this finished product by Stephen King, and they're like, "You have a writer strike, dude. What else are you gonna do? Yeah. Here's this." And so it was basically. In- and That's I will, and it is a, it is a bleak film. I yeah. mean, there is no, there is no denying, uh, it's a dark film. Um, I would say, I mean, all of Stephen King's movies deal with dark subject matter, but I do think that this is one of his films that is really dealing heavily in the supernatural side mm-hmm. of things, but then is also very, uh, connected to the human emotion and real, bleak despair that life can hand you and i and there's a few books of his that i've read that i haven't seen adapted that i feel like walk the same yeah uh line is that and i uh one that comes to mind is rose matter where um i just don't think that because of supernatural stuff i think if you saw it on screen it would just come off kind of goofy it just wouldn't yeah it just wouldn't translate as well and i think this movie is one that just about gets the job done. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, it's, 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 it, it's, it's a very fine line to walk. And I think that it's something, and that's why I think it works so well as a film because it does do a good job of like giving you that human emotion, mm-hmm. but also dealing with this sort of like supernatural element, yeah. which when you go into that world, you, you, you have always to suspend, risk something. Yeah, you, yes. you risk a lot of things. You risk a lot of, um, yeah, you risk a lot, especially like with hey man, believability of characters and like what they I, can hang on to. I feel like if you're watching a movie, you have to you have to own the willing suspension of disbelief. Like you are watching a movie. This is not reality. Right. You have to just go, this is the reality of this movie I'm watching. So I don't know. I'm I guess I'm a sucker or I'm super gullible. I don't know. But I I will unless it's just like no. Well, that ghost would not act that way. Right, yeah. And, I, and, I'll, <laughs> and I'll say this. I'll, like, so this is, uh, so I'll I'll bring up a, my, and this is, I rarely do this on the show. Okay, oh my God, um, yes, go. But I rarely do this on the show. But uh, a modern film that I really like, a, a modern horror film that I really respect and I, I think is legitimately scary is The yeah. Conjuring. Oh, sure. And The Conjuring, I think, deals with, uh, it, it, 
it walks the line between something that is supernatural, but because you're saying this was based on a true story mm-hmm. and it deals with like real life people, you, you have, you, you have something to cling to. Yeah. Um, but it tries to deal with the emotions of a family, like in turmoil. Um, but in relation to this movie, what I'll say, one thing that made me think of this movie when uh-huh. I saw the conjuring yeah. that bothered me is in the conjuring, uh, you know, we get the family there, uh, you know, weird stuff starts to happen. Yeah. But the first thing that happens is their dog uh, is mysteriously killed by this entity. Yeah. By this evil force. And like, <laughs> uh, they, they allow about, you know, all of like one minute and they're like, oh man, it sucks. The dog got killed. And then it's like, you know, everybody's fine. No one's like really bummed out mm-hmm. period. Um, but in this movie, they really take the time and, sh- you know, granted it's a movie about, pet, you know, pet cemeteries, but, they really give you that sense of dread early on yeah. about what death is about. And I think it is something that that's, and gr- grant, these are two different movies, but it, it was something it's that I immediately, point, it's something I immediately thought of is like, this movie focuses on um, the way children see death and the pet yeah. is the first experience that yeah. hopefully they're going to have when they experience death. And, and granted that's the focus of this film, but it was just funny to me, like thinking of that being a the first element of like yeah. terror happening in a horror film, and it was like they were just yeah, oh, it was like whatever. Dog died. No, actually, like the um, I have so many feelings about church in this movie. Um, church is the cat. <laughs> church is the cat. Yes, um, who's played by seven different cats too, which is really fun. So many. They all really, I could never tell that one cat was different no, than the other. They had. They had. Um, a, a, each cat do they were trained to do he has own separate special, things separate things special yeah. trick that he could do yeah um one thing i do love about when they when they find um church dead is is that scene the way that um dale midkiff reacts a, a, as a dad is um he's like the first thing he thinks of is man my daughter's really going to be messed up about this and that is how a dad's going to react. Like, what am I going to do about this? And it's not just like shoving it aside. Like he's having an inner turmoil, you know, uh, conflict about it. Like, do I tell her? Do I just say, I don't know, the damn cat didn't come home. Um, And that's a very real thing. And I think the way that death is approached in this movie, it starts off in a very real way. And, then just kind of spirals out of out of control with starting with the death of church. Yeah. And I I do think that they there's a real sense of dread and danger in this film uh mm-hmm. with the road with the trucks and uh with uh, Fred, so much- Fred Gwynn's character saying, you know, need to get that cat fixed cuz cats that are fixed don't tend to wander. Yeah. You know, and and just the him showing them the pet cemetery and saying, there's so you know, much this, foreshadowing. Yeah. There's so, you know, almost like, uh, I mean, he, he almost like he can see, yeah, you guys are in for like a really bad time here. If you don't prepare yourselves, I've been here. I know, I know what's going to, what's going to mm-hmm. happen. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, to me, this is a movie. It's again, it's, it's not a perfect film. Um, but I think it, it, it does toe that line really great between I do feel for these characters um, and I feel for them in different ways. I mean, we both, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, you have a, you have a strong feeling about the mom character. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, which, which is something that's funny. I watched for if you th- would tell me a little bit about this, but something I was watching for when, yeah. I, wa- when I was rewatching the film. She's just so cold. She's very cold and I find, and I don't normally, I think maybe I just have a predisposition to like identify with like the mom, um, first, but in this, like I'm totally right there with it, with the dad, like when, um, so Fred Gwynn tells him to get your cat fixed. Okay. So they're taking their, their cat or they're talking about church is going to go in. He's going to get fixed. Their daughter, um, is like, is he going to be okay? And mom is like, he's going to be fine, right? Tell her everything's going to be fine, right? And he's like, everything's going to be fine, the dad. And then whispers to her, if it's not fine, this is on you. Whispers to the mom. Yeah, whispers to the mom, this is on you. 
and it's such a real sobering moment and and i think we we kind of already have talked like their their relationship the mom and dad relationship in this is it seems like a strained some sort of tension happening. yeah there's some tension strain here um and she's not she's kind of like real kind of bags on the pet cemetery in the beginning yeah and, you know it's a nice day fred Quinn's taking him down there he's getting them uh yeah you know he, showing them showing them around and she, and she's like this is a terrible thing i can't believe that we're here what a sad sight and he's instead saying this isn't sad or this isn't something that should be scary this is like where all of these kids that have had so many pets die because of this road this is where they come to grieve and to see their and to not yeah. see but to place to, of rest place yeah, of peace to visit their pets but I, I and it's funny because i i kind of i remembered her being kind of cold but then I, so after you <laughs> mentioned that i re, when i was rewatching i was like man she is really cold in the beginning but then i i wondered if the reasoning for that being was that when she brings up the death of her when we go to the flashback of her sister and how that affected her she has this different view on death and so she's maybe like a little bit more uh, defensive about we find out a little bit more experiencing yeah. death um but it's still yeah she does come off very it's a, it's a and I think maybe it, I mean I wonder if things were cut out of the movie and that's why you know there was more an explanation about why she she I mean, was so cold to the family but she starts off super cold um I, I think from visiting the pet cemetery from you know daughter swinging in a in a tire swing in the tree and being like be careful of and like not not happy about the fact that she's in a tire swing just like cutting all these things down she's super cold about it yeah um and yeah maybe this is all stemming from the story we learn later um which we might talk about um a little bit later. Yeah. And I think, and you know, and it's just, I, I think that it is my interpretation was that it is a, what death means to her is different because she saw her, she was happy that her younger, or she was happy that her older sister died because of in this, in the very scary, creepy scene that everybody, we should remembers. probably explain this real quickly. Um, so there's a flashback sequence in which uh, her sister had really bad scoliosis or it's no, like she men- had spinal meningitis. Spinal meningitis yeah. And so her back was really deformed and her, she was like having trouble breathing. She and was this kind of monstrous yeah, figure this, like, that they this, kept in yeah, the attic. And uh, yeah. And the sort of secret that they kept. And so she, the, the, sister had finally her sister passed away when she was there alone and so they flash back to the sequence and it's a really effective scary scene scariest scene in the movie that i remember people remember zelda the sister from this movie sister but she explains it whenever she found you know realized that her sister was dead she was laughing and not crying that she was actually relieved you know and so death as a child meant something different to her you know she was affected by it scarred by it and the husband being a doctor, death is different to him because mm-hmm. it's more of a clinical thing. He, it's something that he's dealt with um, several times. And yeah, it's it's everyone death. Like Fred Gwynn character is, you know, death is different to him. So he, I think it is uh, the theme of it. I think there's something re- relatable for everyone, um, which is why I think it's it's a movie that you can care back the characters because in some way, shape or form, there's something you can identify with um, an experience of, of actual death, which is again, it's, it's a bleak subject and it's something that it's not something that we ever, I think sit around and want to talk about, you know, but it's, it's something that is the one all knowing thing that we know eventually will happen. Yeah. Um, Not to get too, (laughs) Yeah, not to be too uh, dark, know, but too dark, but yeah, it's so. I think that this movie does a good job of tapping into you know, and even the uh, the um, housekeeper that death to her, you know, right away, right off the bat, like I found out I got cancer, like I'm done, you know. what I mean, like it's it, it is it was like real cut and dry, you know. There was yeah, no. We don't know much about this housekeeper. She interacts a little bit, and then you find out that her mom had cancer. She finds out, and she's like, "Well, that's my future." and you know, hangs herself in the basement. Yeah. 
So it is very, um, very, yeah, I think that there's the themes in here are very strong of like death and dying and like how, um, people deal with it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, certainly throughout the movie it gets, you know, there's this where the movie is smart is that toying with the idea of like, well, if we can change that, um, and it's like this inevitable thing. It's just like, you can't change it. Like you, you think you can. And, and yeah. how like when he buries them and they come back and they're not the same, um, it's just like, it's something that's like uncontrollable and it gets a little jumbled there, you know, toward, you know, it's like, what's happening. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> are they zombies or whatever? <clears throat> but, uh, but I do think that the themes are strong. Uh, death is strong. And the themes of dealing with death are strong. Um, of not being able to let go. Yeah. And, and understandably so in the death of a child, that, which is something that I feel like Stephen King is, man, he's, he's no he's stranger really in, to that. He's really into harm and death to children <laughs> is like his, his, <laughs> your go-to yeah. person. Um, yeah. But, and, and I wonder if it's like, cause it's a taboo thing, you know, it's just like, it's, but it is like a death of a child is like, you know, you, as a parent, you don't want, you, 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 you don't ever expect that you'll see you'll mm-hmm. bury your child like you you know the idea is that you'll yeah that's one of the worst fears as a your, parent your child you know that you're you're not gonna outlive your child um and i think this is really this movie really preys on that fear um in a very effective way yeah um the uh in the scene where where gage does die um the scream that his dad lets out is still to this day and like they they, it's like the scream and then like a picture snapshot to like gauges you know like different stills of him as a child um the scream that he lets out seems so unbelievably real to me i don't know if you can like right hone that in right now but it's so like oh god my heart just aches When the interview with the actor that portrayed the father, he mentions that when he when they made the movie, he didn't mm-hmm. have kids. And okay. in the interview, he's reflecting back on that scene, yeah. saying now that he has children and how much more when he watches a movie, it affects him. Yeah, you know, I can like imagine. He, it, it's, it, it's like he, he said that he couldn't really... I mean, he tapped into it as far as he could as an actor, but he said now, like, it's just like unimaginable to him, the, the heartache that would be to, yeah. And yeah, it goes to a really dark place. Um, and then kind of shifts. I, I think this is like pet cemetery. Um, I think is is set apart from other horror movies because it is, it's not necessarily going for a jump scare. Like there are some, but it's not necessarily going for that. It's more this this emotionally terrorizing idea of something that hits close to home, something that's real and tangible like death. And it's so much it's why this movie isn't scary to me really anymore is because it feels way more sad than anything else. Yeah, I think it's like that sadness that makes it uh truly like not the uh, your run in the mill typical horror movie. Well, let's go to another clip and then we'll come back. Uh, We'll talk about the ending of this film because we we had not really difference of opinions, but we had our own variation of like how we felt about it. So we'll go to a clip, uh, go to a scary clip toward the end of the movie (laughs) uh, and then we'll uh, come back. Daddy, will you come over and play with me? First I played with Dad. Then mommy came and I played with mommy. We played, daddy. We had an awful good time. Now I want to play with you. So, creepy scene. Very creepy scene. Yeah, but it's that's the scene in particular that I wanted to talk about when right. Gage makes the phone call. It's where the uh-huh. movie. So we have there. You know, we have different feelings about the ending of this. Let's film. do this, Justin. Let's do it. Um, so my take is I feel, and again, I've said this before, I I really enjoy this film tremendously. I by no means think it's a perfect film. Um, 
I think it walks this fine line between supernatural and re- reality. Um, but it's the a la- really good story. Yeah, it's a good story. No matter um, anything else. But the last 20 minutes of this film, to me, it switches tone very quickly and it kind of turns, in my in my opinion, in my eyes, with the phone call with Gage, um, kind of comes to me, it like turns into like a Chucky film almost. You mean when zombie toddler Gage makes a phone call? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then- uh, We don't see that. Just saying. We don't we see don't it, see but it. but I feel like it. And then with the giggling and laugh, laughing, and just his <laughs> size, his demeanor and size, it's kind of turned. It feels like it turns into like almost like Chucky ish, like Child's Play, a Chucky movie. Mm-hmm. Which again, it's not. I don't. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It just to me, um, it switches to more of a this goofy horror movie tone. And it's effective. Again, I mean, I think that like the last twenty minutes is really it, they amp up the energy. You know, yeah. for an intended pers- purpose of like making it more scary and it gets more violent. But to me, I don't know. Like a for me, like I would have liked it to be a little uh, less uh, in that vein. Like if the tone would have s- stuck more to like the, how they originally started it. Um, I don't necessarily think it's like a bad way to end the movie. And I I, I really like the last scene. I think it's a good. It's got a good punch to it. But I think it's just like the Gage character, because he he also doesn't really say too much um, sure. earlier in the film, and then you know he's got all these lines toward the end. Yeah. But I think that that you know the movie needed something, it needed a drive toward the end, like this sort of action packed ending, which it delivers. Yeah. Again, I don't think it's bad, but I think it, to me, I was. It's the only part of the movie to me where the tone shifts so quickly that I felt um, I would have liked to have seen it like hold hold itself back a little bit and continue mm-hmm. with the slow burn that it started with. And I know we were talking about this and you felt, you know, you were, re- you were really into the, the gauge, <laughs> the Chucky gauge. I mean, character. okay. One, the, the ending of this movie, um, everyone, including church, not including the daughter, the, the daughter is the only main character that does not die in the last like 30 minutes of the movie. It's just like bang, bang, boom. And for a movie that spends this whole whole time, like this emotionally traumatic buildup to this moment where dad loses his friggin' mind, um, I think no matter what happens in the ending, it can be the craziest, most absurd ending, but it still works because it's building towards such insanity, really. Um, as far as Gage goes, yes, Gage barely says any words when he is a normal, alive, human, toddler, non-zombie creature. Um, <laughs> when, he, when he does call dad and say... I want I play with mommy. Now I want to play with you. That, yes. Every time I'm going to laugh. I'm totally going to laugh. But if I, like, think about if you got that call. If your son called you. Right. And you were, like, alluding, your son was alluding to the fact that he killed your partner. And now he wants to hang out. Right. Like that's creepy well, as that, hell. And that's the thing is like I guess for me like it because to me like you know you say you laugh at that scene like that's the thing is like the reaction I get it's like it's not it's not yeah. a scary moment for me and that's why I feel I laugh because I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, it, I guess like to me it's like and I I think it's just because I have this strong uh, I really love child's play and it's like yeah. it's it's a very he, I get, he takes I get what this, you're yeah, saying. I can't get off of this Chucky thing. I I get what you're saying about Chucky. I um, I like I like the Chucky movies, even even up until Chucky three, actually. Sure. Um, but Chucky to me is not like I don't find him funny. I don't find him funny at all. He's like he's up there with the trilogy of terror, Zumi fetish doll. He he sucks. Yeah, I, but, I don't like Chucky. But I guess more so in the way of like we're going. We went from this like very solemn. Uh, dark film to like n- not necessarily like a one liner horror movie kind of yeah. thing, but it's like it turned into like this not slasher, but like th- it gets really violent, ramped up, and he's like going around killing people. The little kids going around just okay, okay, slashing okay. People. He now don't send 
anyone out there who's not seen this movie into a frenzy thinking that this is a child going out and murdering a bunch of people. This is done in a really good way, I feel like. One, Gage takes out Fred Gwynn, the neighbor, the one who really is to blame for all of this, telling anyone about the Pet cemetery in the first place. Um, he takes him out in a le- legit way. And which still, every time I get into bed, I think about my Achilles tendon, you know, because of this scene in Pet Cemetery. He takes him out in a legit way. I don't get the weird cannibalism chewing on the neck part, but moving on, um, the the killing of the mom, we don't see it. It is insinuated. And um, I mean, that's that's who Gage takes out, right? Or Fred Gwynn right, and the yeah, mom. Yeah, it's not like he and, kills the whole neighborhood, but... <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure that that is set out there. But when Dad takes out Gage, it is, you know, I almost think of it in a very, like, humane, like, veterinary sort of way. Like, he, he euthanizes Gage. Right. And and there's not really, like, Gage, you know, throws himself at Dad. And, like, I mean, he is a toddler. He's able to throw himself off uh, or throw Gage off of him. But, I mean, he does... Yeah, and I he think euthanizes yeah, him. and I, I, I mean, you know, I certainly feel like we need to have Gage do something, ver- something very detestable for an audience to, in order for Dad to take him for, out for too. an audience to accept that the Dad's going to euthanize him. Yeah, so I, 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 I see that aspect. I guess it just for me, it, I wish it would have played. It's just not. I don't think it's distasteful. I, I just wish it would have played a little bit. I do. I think that how how it progresses from when Gage returns from the dead to his murderous spree to when he's taken out by dad i think it it, it is a really nice arc too because we have um him returning murderous spree and then dad taking him out by just an injection right and then he stumbles and I find the most disturbing thing I find from this movie as far as like from a child actor point of view is the gauge stumbling from having the injection of whatever dad gives him. Like he stumbles like he's dying and he like falls over. That to me is super disturbing watching a child doing that because it is it feels like shoot I'm watching a kid die right now. Yeah. Yeah. And stumbling away and saying, you know, no fair, play with you, no fair. Like, it is, I get the jokey aspect of it. Yeah. And it's not like I haven't made these gauge one-liners from this movie jokes with people, friends of mine that also know this movie. Yeah. Um, But it doesn't make it any less creepy, but it also returns us to the sadness aspect of this movie. Yeah, the I mean the music and everything changes, but it, but it tonally yeah. t- tonally to me it like it sh- it's it 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 switches. Do you hate the gauge back. death scene? Do I you don't, hate the gauge death scene? I don't hate scene? the gauge death scene. I think I just hate the quick I don't hate anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. I'm not uh, trying to pigeonhole I you. Don't, I don't hate anything. I just to me it's just like it's a very very fast back and yeah. forth tonal shift. I will say that, uh, that, it, that I think again, I don't, I don't think it like deters the movie in any way, but it, for me personally, yeah, it had me so, um, I was so wrapped up in the characters and that tonal s- switch back and forth, uh, kind of through always throws me. I, I will say, I, I, I do agree with you that once, once Gage dies and once dad decides to bury him in the pet cemetery, to see if he'll come back the way Church did, um, I I believe that at that point of insanity where Dad has reached is where the tone of the movie changes, and it goes it goes from slow build and emotionally like gut wrenching to terror because in essence we have a zombie child yeah. re- returning. And I and I and I understand. It's like and with any and I think it's it's I think the. the with scary movies, horror movies and in, in general, it is always really tough. Like the last 30 minutes of most horror films yeah. fall on, can, you know, they, they really kind of falter. Um, and I, I guess that's just like why the, the ending is always 
affected me in a way because I thought this one was a movie that like really effectively built its way up all the way up yeah. until the last 20 minutes. But I understand yeah. like you need, you kind of need that, you know, you need, you need to have that terror. You need to have some, you know, that rampage. Um, otherwise you're left with a really depressing movie about death. The, the only thing I would say that, um, that sticks out to me uh, for for the ending uh, as far as the ending goes it's not so much like what gage does like after returning from the from the dead it's more the um how um okay so we have um the the creed house where the family lives and then like right across the street we have fred gwynn the neighbor who set all of this in motion after gage kills fred gwynn his house turns into like this um uh almost like poltergeist infused like everything's melting everything's rotting and gross like all of the interior just starts deteriorating inside and it's almost very i mean it's very poltergeist like um in that way that it's maybe all of the spirits from this you know burial ground or something that 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 um the pet cemetery is built on that is making this happen but to me in the movie that is the only aspect of this movie that we don't explore enough and i know in in the pet cemetery novel we do that that is explored a little bit more so, I mean, you know, we both agree. We both enjoy this film. Um, yes. We had different feelings about the ending, but and that's okay, you know. Um, yeah. But we, we have to move on to our picks of the week. So, it's time. Um, are there any, before we close this out, are there any final things you had to say about Pet Cemetery? Um, one one final quick thing. Okay. That the, the, the short end of the stick, the raw deal that I think Churchill, Church, the cat, got in this movie... Um, is the reason that I told myself if I ever came across a gray cat that needed a home, um, I would name it church. And that's what I do. Four, four week old cat that came into my life is now currently my cat named church because I felt like, man, being the experiment for like the cat that like, you know, wasn't, I mean, got fixed late in life right? and then wasn't, was roaming outside by a busy highway not maintained it was gonna die basically then what do you do with it you bury it to see if it'll come back from the dead it comes back it hates you it defends the child of your family against you because it hates you for bringing it back and making it a zombie cat right and then what happens to church you kill it as an experiment to see if you can kill your zombie child so this is my last thought on Pet Cemetery. Why I decided to give the cat in this movie a better life through its name. I don't think that really works, but it's why I named my cat Church. It works for you, Lindsay. It works. I mean, I just think Church got a raw deal in this movie. Yeah. And that's why Church, my cat, gets a gets a good life. Yeah. Yeah. That, wait, wait that's all make, I got. That's a way to make amends. <laughs> I don't have seven gray gray haired cats. It's just just one named Church. And you're and you're getting upset with me about tonal shifts. Okay, I guess I'm taking it too personally. I'll just uh, pack it away. Just I think it's time to move it on to the down. pick of the week. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, we're moving move on. on now. Pick of the week. <laughs> What's your pick of the week? My this pick time, of the Justin? week uh, was Ironweed. Um, Again, my connection being Fred Gwynn, but also there being a connection. Uh, this film deals with death of a child and uh, the character sees ghosts um, like they do in Pet Cemetery. Kind of eerie when I was watching it. That wasn't my intention to begin with. It was just a Fred Gwynn connection. And, and then, then you started watching all it. All of a sudden, I was like, whoa, I couldn't have planned this better. Though I kind of blew it because I just explained no, that you I, need to go into more know. depth yeah. about it than that. I will go in depth if you give me a second. Oh my god! <laughs> Such an emotional episode. So my pick of the week was Ironweed, starring Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep. 
also starring uh, one of my favorite singer-songwriters, Tom Waits, and came out in 1987. And this was a film uh, that I I don't think I would have enjoyed as a kid. This is one that I, th- I, I picked it because I also think that like not a lot of people may have seen this one. I think it is worthy of checking out for sure. It is a period piece drama and it is a very rambling movie. But in a way, that's how the, char- the characters, uh, Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, are both portrayed as like sort of alcoholic drifters. And the movie kind of rambles on spending time with them and isn't totally plotless, but like does go on for a long time. Clocks in at about two hour and 23 minutes. Um, so it, it is a long film, but it does deal with death like Jack Nicholson's character uh, we find uh, has been away from his family for like the last 20 or so years because uh, when he was drunk, he dropped his baby boy and killed him. And very, very morbid opening where he's uh, telling the story at the graveside of his son because the only job he can get is uh, digging graves for a couple bucks for the day. Um, and he meets up with his friend Tom Waits who uh, informs him that he just found out that he got cancer and has only got six months to live. So we have in the very first five minutes of the film, we have a very bleak opening and then it just kind of goes on to, uh, he meets up with Meryl Streep who's much younger than him and she had always wanted to be a singer but she's like kind of a big drunk now. And they meet up at a bar several times. Fred Gwynn owns a place and he's the bartender there. And uh, Jack Nicholson keeps seeing these ghosts of a man that he killed when he was younger. Uh, there was a strike going on and uh, he threw a rock at this guy who was a scab and hit him in the head and killed him. And so this guy keeps coming back to haunt him. And so he keeps seeing the vision of this dead this dead man that he killed when he was younger. So the movie does deal a lot with death, but uh, he eventually makes his way. It's Halloween night. And they do they do they deal with death in a very harsh way. Uh, they find a a homeless woman who's outside this bar and they won't let her into uh, the halfway house because she's just they 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 just they, she's like a lost cause of them because um, she's so drunk and they're trying to just keep her warm um, and they're all worried about her they know that she's just got kind of a lost cause and then uh, like later on after they've been drinking they come out and they're like oh sh- there's dogs like trying to eat her because she's has died yeah, it deals with a lot of bleak subject matter. It deals with death in a way, kind of in the same way Pet Cemetery does, in very real bleak matter, and how the characters just kind of deal with it. You know, this is going to happen. I've dealt with death. Everyone has their own their own experience with it. Um, eventually, Jack Nicholson tries to reconnect with his wife and his family that he's been estranged from. Not to great effect. It's 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 also a very depressing scene but this is a movie this is one of those actor movies where both Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep are giving these just like amazing performances and I will give this to Jack Nicholson I mean Jack Nicholson is a char- is an actor that I really respect but I think that he he has you know he's a lot he's got that Jack Nicholson the things that he does best um he's done so many times that uh in later films it's like I can't shake that I can't shake that it's Jack Nicholson. Um, so I was actually very pleasantly surprised in this film. I feel like he's a very s- toned down version of what he usually plays big. And uh, Meryl Streep, I'll say, she plays it pretty big, but she's supposed to be drunk through the whole movie, so she kind of plays things over the top. But Meryl Streep's great. She does an excellent job. Um, and I really I love Tom Waits. I think like this was a... It's not a huge role, but it's a it's a role catered to Tom Waits. I think like Tom Waits, like I mean, he's probably only like thirty something in this movie, but he, he's one of those guys that's like always wanted to play like a sixty year old, like older drunk guy, and so he just he he's like perfect for this role. Um, like everything he says just seems feels like totally authentic. But yeah, overall, it's like it's one of those movies. It's worth giving it a look it, if it's one that you missed. Um, it it is totally kind of like an actor movie you're just watching it for performance you're not necessarily watching it for story and it does have a very slow pace not necessarily in a bad way but it does spend its time with its characters and you get to know them really really well and it's it's kind of one of those movies it's almost like a hangout they're just like hanging out doing stuff talking about stuff um kind of like rambles 
but not necessarily in the bad way. I think it works for the movie. It sounds like something I would be very interested in. Um, I love those types of movies that are, you know, like the actors actor movie um, where it's really the, what makes the movie or the performances and like the story, like they make the story happen. Yeah. Um, that sounds like something that would be totally up my alley. Mm -hmm. And I was just reading the, I guess the, the, uh, novel that it was based upon won, won a Pulitzer prize for fiction. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at either. (laughs) Well, what was your pick of the week? Well, um, mine's definitely a gear shift, um, into the boy who could fly. And into resurrecting this movie may seem like the cheesiest pick of the week that I've chosen to date. Um, This one evokes some of the deepest, most buried nostalgic feelings from the Generation X era or the beginning of the millennial generation than I can remember. Like I said before, the title's totally laughable, um, but so are a lot of movie titles, you know? But I would wager The Boy Who Could Fly against E.T. or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, maybe even a little bit of Home Alone. Upon revisiting, it's not at all the after-school special vibe that I had remembered. Um, It's not a love story. It's more of a coming-of-age tale about two kids connecting. Eric, the supposed boy who could fly, is befriended by his new neighbor, the enchanting Millie, who feels drawn to this mysteriously mute boy who doesn't interact with any other classmates, let alone anyone else in his life. Um, This movie is not only about like being an outcast, but it's equally about trauma. And I pretty sure autism, like I'm, uh, it's not really said in the movie that it's about autism, but like revisiting it, it's certainly what it seems like. And if given the proper attention, Eric would have greatly benefited from from a good, you know, from a, f- a few good trauma-informed educators in high school, um, understanding the grief of losing his parents in a plane crash, and ultimately coming to understand why he silently sits on the, uh, his window ledge with his arms extended as if he could fly. Like, all of this kind of falls into place. I feel like this movie is easily put into the after-school special category but i really challenge you to revisit it and find that it's more than a public service announcement about autism it fits securely in with a sentimentality of et as i've already talked about many times in today's podcast use that willing suspension of disbelief on whether a teenage boy can actually fly or not and you should be able to ride this movie out to the end Now, The Boy Who Could Fly kicked off the career for Jay Underwood, who played Eric. Some of you might remember him as Bug from Uncle Buck um, and a string of other 80s and beyond starring roles. Lucy Deakins, who plays Millie, um, I've already mentioned in a previous pick of the week, The Great Outdoors. Uh, will always be my favorite sweetheart lady of the 80s. There's, I have a few uh, favorite ladies from the 80s and she's definitely one of them. Um, Favorite ladies from the 80s. I mean, we won't uh, even talk about uh, Catherine Mary Stewart. We'll get there one day. But uh, but Lucy Deacons, great outdoors, the boy who could fly, love her. Now, <laughs> what? Now I know your affinity for the town. Dude, Catherine from- Mary Stewart, come on. Yeah. Night of the Comet, Weekend at Bernie's? I can't even, I can't even start with her. That is not the pick of the week right now I know. <laughs> um so lucy deacon's mom um who was played by bonnie bedelia uh best known from die hard or presumed innocent Ugh, presumed innocent such a great movie with she and harrison ford um she plays a solid yet frustrated mom character Um, And her disconnect and sadness really weighs heavily upon this movie, I'd say. Now, honorable mention performances go to the two Freds, that being Fred Gwynn, most notably of what we've been talking about, Pet Cemetery, and of course, the classic TV show, The Munsters. We didn't even bring that up. And Fred Savage, better known from The Wonder Years and The Princess Bride. Now, while Gwynn's talents weren't... um, you know, used uh, to the best of their ability as he played Eric's drunk uncle. 
um, Savage's character, um, who was Millie's, uh, the little brother of Millie, um, added even more heart to this movie um, as he puts on a tough demeanor in order to face all of life's obstacles that are thrown at him. Um, also, a uh, second best runner up, since we're talking about Pet Cemetery, um, goes to the family dog of Fred Savage, who plays a big role throughout this whole movie. And Justin, I, I know you can feel me on the dog angle I feel through you. this. Um, there is one tear jerking moment, but don't worry. It, it, you'll recover. It's cool. The dog makes it out. Oh, spoiler alert. But it's hairy there. I need to know. It's hairy there for a second. Director Nick Castle, who also did The Last Starfighter and who wrote Escape from New York, I really think nailed the transition from childhood to adulthood with The Boy Who Could Fly. Um, God, every time I say the name of the movie, it's just like, what? I don't know what would be another name for the movie, just something else. But I think he did a great job with this story. Um, I will never fault him for anything. It feels like it was done with such compassion um, while also not being like too soft. Um, and it, But at the same time, it also might make you flash back to a few sentimental moments from your childhood. That being said, there are two shooting star instances in this movie, so you're not completely safe from total cheese ball moments. But like... Willing suspension of disbelief, sure. man. I'm riding that it's wave. A, it's a big part hard. of this episode. I'm riding that wave real hard yeah. this episode. But I will leave you with the mystery of whether Eric can actually fly or not. You got to make it through the um, whole movie to find out if that actually happens or not. The, this is, again, another movie that you use for a pick of the week that I haven't seen in a long time. And now I'm probably going to revisit and oddly, the only thing I remember from The Boy Who Could Fly, and I mean, yeah. I'm talking like, I probably haven't seen this movie it's since a, I was like It's nine, a long time ago, man. Nine or ten. Yeah. I remember them like filling this like water gun with pee and shooting it, one of the bullies. Yeah. And it happens. the only other reason why <laughs> as an adult that I know about this movie is because I'm a hardcore John Carpenter junkie. Yeah. And John, Nick Castle, who wrote and directed Boy I Could Fly, yeah. you know, co-wrote uh, Escape from New York, but was also the original Michael Myers and, and John oh, Carpenter's duh. Halloween. Yeah. Which is always totally. in, uh, and, uh, yeah. And uh, soon will be seen on screen as the new Michael Myers. In yeah, that true. The upcoming Halloween, which is... I'm not real big into the whole remake, reboot, whatever thing, but I've been following this Halloween story since they started filming. I'm a huge David Gordon Green fan, and the fact that John Carpenter is uh, co-producing Jamie Lee Curtis doing the music. Jamie Lee Curtis is in it, and Nick Castle's back is the. I'm in it. Uh, I'm gonna go. Yeah. You know, I think it comes out October. It comes out in like a couple weeks, so yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's one we'll go see. Oh, we're definitely seeing that together. Yeah. I hope so. It's already a date. Um, I'm not. Uh, I I keep my my expectations low for these kind of things, but, but I was in, exciting, I was into the trailer yeah. that they put out, and I'm yeah. I'm very curious. Um, it is they got my attention. And oh yeah, for sure. I've Me been too. following along for like Me a too. long time on Instagram, like their their little teasers, and Jamie Lee Curtis on Instagram's been. Been Jamie Lee Curtis it. has been, been blowing it, it up. She's she been has. pushing it a lot on her Instagram. Yeah, she has. So, I trust you, Jamie Lee. I'm a. I'm, we're we're always going to be behind the true yeah. blues of all of these uh, movies. That, I would just that say, if, the game. If, if there was going to be a crew that could like not f up, uh, uh, like that, a, like this a would reinvention, be this is they, yeah. they've got it. So, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm gonna go see it. Oh, I you're taking me all with right. you. We'll so. do it. We'll it's do happening. it. So those are our picks of the week, uh, Iron Weed and The Boy Who Could Fly, two totally different movies, but uh, brought together, actually, <laughs> the whole episode brought together by none other than Fred Gwynn. Herman Munster. That's right. So, uh, again, as always, my favorite part of the podcast. Oh. I can't help it. It is. This is your Murray moment. <laughs> Oh, 
chicks dig me. Because I rarely wear underwear, and when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even show. Okay, this is so scrumptious. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes, the grace, all striking. That was fun. So since we've talked a little bit about church from Pet Cemetery, I thought it'd be an appropriate time to talk about how Billy became the voice for another legendary cat, um, that being the cartoon king of lasagna that we all know, Garfield. So what exactly motivated our Billy, a man who is usually so particular about the movie roles he chooses to do, how did he like get involved with doing the voice for Garfield? Well, simple answer is that he thought it was a Coen Brothers movie. He knew that Joel Coen was a funny, great, witty writer, um, that he and his brother Ethan had done a, a handful of great movies like The Hudsucker Proxy, Fargo, The Big Lebowski, Our, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, just to name a few. He read the first couple of pages of, of the Garfield script, thought it was okay, said he'd do it, then just kind of forgot about it. So time passed, filming completed, the movie was edited together, um, then it was time for Billy to record the voiceovers. But the further he got into the script while recording, he kept finding problems, thinking that it wasn't funny and starting to, like, trying to rework the lines. He finally said, okay, I need to actually watch this movie since it's finished because none of these lines are working. As the movie progressed, as he was watching it, he kept saying over and over, who the hell is cutting this thing? What was Cohen even thinking? And it was at that point when it was pointed out to him that this was another Joel Cohen with one letter difference in his last name, not the Joel Cohen that he was thinking of, a completely different writer. So as the show must go on, um, Billy reworked the dialogue to make it funnier, to make it work within the scenes that had already been shot, finished, totally completed and edited together. Um, Think about how hard that must have been and just how much um, pressure Billy had been under. He said he had soaked through multiple shirts um, in just one day of shooting from all the stress of reworking the dialogue from an already completed movie. Um, now, needless to say, the movie grossed a boatload of money and received not so shabby reviews. Um, Billy, although kind of super annoyed at all you know, how all of this went down, was gracious about it and said he'd, you know, do the sequel as long as the situation didn't repeat itself. Well, you know, it kind of did repeat itself. Um, Billy said that the second time around with the sequel, it was worse than before because so many more writers got involved. He said that it was a complete disaster and that, you know, he agreed to do it mainly because the first one raked in so much money. Um, I can't really say that I blame him, but it's funny how deeply involved he got when in no, in no way um, was it, you know, supposed to start out this way. Billy said this about Garfield, um, you know, about his whole Garfield challenge, I like to call it. You put me in a box, I'll figure a way out how to make it work. It's a funny and frustrating story for Billy, and um, it does make me want to revisit Garfield to try to figure out what Billy changed and to see the effort he put into this one. Um, it's a totally ridiculous story, but um, for some reason, like, not putting, you know, Bill Murray into a precarious situation, but, like, putting him into any situation where it's like, wait... Everything that I thought has been completely turned on its head. I don't even know where to start from here, but he just like kept going. And <laughs> I, I didn't think that you, 
I just had no clue this was going to go into Garfield. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I realize <laughs> the connection the, with the cat, but yeah, you know, but uh, church Garfield. I've never seen either of the Garfield movies. I've I've seen I've seen I haven't seen the second one, but I've seen Garfield and it's totally fine. I mean, I was a Garfield fan as a kid and it was a great live action, you know, whatever. I'd put it the same caliber as like uh, the Scooby-Doo live action one, which I actually enjoy. I really like Scooby-Doo as a kid, yeah. too. It's um not as a, you know, it's not terrible. I'll yeah. say that. And like a lot of people agreed to like the live action Garfield. Um, I mean, it, it it really wasn't that bad of a movie. It, I, I think that these types of movies sometimes struggle with that being there's already a legacy before it. And it's like a live action version of this like cartoon. Is it going to be really that great? But I mean, if you really dive into it, it's at, like Garfield, Scooby Doo. Right, yeah. Like they're really actually not that bad. You just have to. I'm going right back to it. Willing suspension of disbelief, right, man. Right, yeah. It's the episode for it. The live action stuff always <laughs> throws me off because it's like uh, where we're at in animation now. It's like so good. Yeah. So it's like to do a live action of a animated thing. Yeah. Just seems yeah. so odd to me, but whatever, you know. I mean, it works for me. It works for me, I think, because my brain's more maybe inclined to accept that. Are you saying disbelief. there's something wrong with my brain? No, I'm not <laughs> saying that. I'm saying I might be just uh, Man, stuck like in some olden times, bro, where I'm just like, like, you know, went to see Garfield and Scooby Doo in a movie with Bill Murray, Sarah Michelle Geller. I think they could have all been done great with their voices, but as an animated film, but whatever. Yeah, I feel like right. we're both super defensive in this I know. podcast Why episode. Why are we fighting so much? I don't know. It's probably because I haven't texted you in like four days. <laughs> I know. It's because you haven't texted me. <sighs> Sorry. That we would need be a to last talk about it. We need to talk about it. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, no, I actually, I actually, uh, I didn't know that about the Cohen brothers connection but i'd actually love to see a bill murray and a Coen brothers movie um i think that would be actually a pretty good fit if uh wes anderson didn't have him uh he's kind of like he's a he's a there's already a quirky director out there who's got him locked down he's got him locked down yeah. i mean bill murray and a Coen brothers movie that makes sense i think it makes sense yeah they haven't really made i mean they've made more good movies and multiple directors could make in a career but yeah. they haven't done anything that's really like got me super excited lately all right joel whatever. ethan why don't you give billy's 800 and number a call and see what's up i, I mean it. obviously you hooked him just on basically your name with garfield so if you can get him with garfield in seems the first like, couple of pages dude like give him a call seems like that that would be a story that would get back then be like oh okay we can get bill murray <laughs> all right those guys can probably get anybody you know you would think so yeah i'm sure they can so that's our Murray moment. Thank you again for that. Of course. Always appreciated. Of course. And that brings us to the end of our podcast. So thanks again for listening to our discussion on Pet Cemetery. We had a lot to go over this. There was a, there was a lot. One. There was a, there was a lot more than I thought there'd be. Yeah, right? Um for better or worse. Um but yeah, we're going to keep it going. I know we've talked about this before, but to remind you um, next episode, we're doing Serial Mom, followed by a bonus episode, which is the original Nightmare on Elm Street. And then we're going to close it out Halloween Eve with one of our faves, uh, 1985's Fright Night. I love that it's right before Halloween. I do too. It's pretty I'm, fun. I'm excited. Uh, so, um, again, you can always find us on Instagram, Don't Push Pause Podcast. Facebook, Don't Push Pause Podcast. You can always reach us directly at Don't Push Pause Podcast at gmail.com. Or go to our website, don'tpushballspodcast.com. Feel free to comment, um, to send us anything, any comments, suggestions, um, share our Facebook page, Instagram. We love hearing from you, and we want to get the word out there about the podcast. Yeah, I always like hearing what uh, other people's like favorite movies are to watch around Halloween. Yeah. It's always it's interesting to me, you know, what people's go-to movies are, because I definitely have a few that I 
I never. I know we could not watch. We could do a podcast every day of October. Yeah. <laughs> well, until uh, next time. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm Justin Johnson, and I'm Lindsay Reber. Thank you. <laughs>